And I'll start with saying that, for your information, this will be recorded. We'll make uh, so that we can all, all get back to this one if there's something that you want to uh, repeat. Well, um, my name is Heidi Kruger, and I actually work at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. But uh, today I think I'm here more for the university side because I am uh, tomorrow having my dissertation here. So if you're interested very much in this topic, so I will be talking at the lecture hall B1 tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So welcome there too. It, it will be more about pheasants tomorrow. And today we will be having a mini symposium um, and we will have some presenters here. I'm very, very, very happy. I must say that uh, farmland birds are my, my, my big love and I'm very, very happy that I have been able to organize this kind of a mini symposium and get Julie here and all these other specialists so that we will be, that we will be hearing today. And um, um, we will be having a break at um, 12 o'clock, a one hour break, and then we'll continue. And at the end, we'll have a miniature workshop where we'll try to talk about the practical things and how we could get this maybe in practice and maybe do some, uh, some policy, a policy brief or something like that. We could make, maybe use this later also. And um, today we will be having presentations from Julie Evel. Julie is from the Game Conservation Trust in, uh, in the UK, and she, or the Trust, and Julie, they have been working a long time with uh, grey partridges. So she has a lot of information on how to get grey partridges um, back in, into nature, and uh, otherwise also how to get biodiversity in the, in the farm and landscape. Then we hear from Alexi Lehikoinen from Luomus. Alexi will tell about the Farmland Bird Index and, uh, and the project that we are working on that. We are developing the index or looking at the index and how it describes our biodiversity. Then we have Markus Piha from uh, Luke. And Markus will tell about farmland birds and uh, what's called the... More or less habitat. Yeah, it's 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 a sort of it's land a use. land use. Um, what was it called? You had the name for it. Well, the name has been changed. Okay, <laughs> so we don't we don't go to the name. Yeah, but it's it's a very interesting thing. It's very as a, it's a very nice approach, and I I look look forward to hearing about it more. And then we have Johan Ekros, who has been studying uh, the the agricultural policy, I think, in Sweden and in Finland. So so he'll give us a very nice insight to the to those thoughts uh, those things and, and then we have Irina here and Irina will talk about the farm virtual farm and uh, EU project and uh, how that is now developing and then you'll also because Emma who was supposed to be here is not unfortunately able to attend so we will Irina will also show Emma's presentation but I, I say I let's begin and I give the floor to Julie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me here. We're all excited about tomorrow. Um, probably Heidi most of all. But um, let's start my presentation. And I will warn you that Heidi said I could have a long time. So I'm going to take a long time. <laughs> And I'm going to speak about a lot of the history that the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust has with gray partridge conservation and how different, um, how we've, we've used an interest in gray partridge to restore gray partridge numbers, but also along the way to try to help um, farmland wildlife as well. So, why gray partridges? Um, well, Gray partridges are interesting. They're not only a farmland bird, they're also a game bird, of course, and especially in the UK. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, and even before that, they were the major game bird of lowland Britain. And so there were bag records going back, actually going back to the time of Darwin, but I'm only showing from the, the 1900 here, um, that we collate in something called the National Game Bag Census. 
that the Game and Wildlife Conservation and Trust hold. And so that, that uh, holds records on numbers of birds shot over certain numbers of area, certain area in hectares now. Um, but the gray partridge is also a red-listed farmland bird with over a 90% decline in the UK since our records began in 67. And of course, it's not just in the UK, but across Europe as well. Um, and since 1980, this is from the pan-European um, monitoring, they've got a, they had a 92% decline there. So definitely a bird on farmland and declining. But the, the key for this is that the interest in hunting or shooting will maybe help us to get landowners to do something positive um, for gray partridges and then look at, um, at add-ons to other farmland birds. And the other thing is that um, due to early researching by um, Dick Potts, who maybe some of you have heard, maybe, um, and him and Southwood and uh, Cross in the early days of the 60s and 70s, looked at gray partridge decline and they found that it was the chick survival primarily driving the decline. And that they related to agricultural intensification. So there was a loss of chick food index, or insects and also combined with a loss of nesting cover and habitat. And then also along the way there was reduced winter cover, but this was probably less of a reason for the early declines at least. So that's, this is kind of like our, sort of our Bible when we start thinking about gray partridge conservation and trying to increase numbers. So the way that the, it's an indirect effect of pesticides. So we are not expecting, although it happened in the early days of pesticide use with DDT, if you read uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, she uses partridges as one of her examples. And it's DDT in some of the early organic chlorine. Um, but what happens with partridges now, and from like the 60s onwards in the UK, is an indirect effect of pesticides. So first of all, there was widespread use of herbicides that knocked out the arable flora in the agricultural land. And the insects that the chicks feed on actually feed on that arable flora. So by taking out the arable flora, you indirectly took out the insects. And then this followed on with a more widespread use of insecticides in uh, the farmland. And particularly, we had some big uses in the late 60s, and then when the UK joined the Common Agricultural Policy in the mid-70s, we had, again, some large uses of insecticides in our cereal crops. And so those took out the insects directly. And in work that I'm not really going to go into today, we show that this is still going on and that you can see an effect from one year to the next. So if you use an insecticide one year, you see the effect in reduced chick food, not just in the current year that you used it, but in ongoing future years. So you're storing up problems with your insects. And then the other reason that um, the species declined, particularly in the, early, or the late 70s, was when we started to get this landscape change in the UK that happened when we joined the Common Agricultural Policy. And you can see the loss of hedgerows and of, and of banks and of semi-natural habitats, all that came about when we joined the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, farmers brought in big, heavy dozers. They took out habitats that had been there for hundreds of years. Um, and that meant there was an increased mortality in, during the nesting period. Um, and that led to more um, decline. And that's particularly because of increased or higher predation risk due to either the hen on the nest or the chick or the eggs in the nest. Also, you, there's the way that the nest prospecting goes around that also increased some of the predation risk on the male as well. So that's the background to why things were going wrong. Um, and then we tried to address this. And we, I mean, the Game of Wildlife Conservation Trust, shooting people who are interested in trying to retain numbers of gray partridges, farmers who are interested in trying to you know, turn the tide on this and not be the people who were the bad guys all the time. They wanted to show they could do something. So I'm going to talk about three UK-based restoration projects. Um, and those are the Salisbury Plain experiment, which was an early experiment to look 
particularly at predation risk and how to address that. The Royston project, which we, the trust did, um, which was to look at both predation control and also increasing habitat for um, chick food. And then the Peppering project, which takes place on the Sussex study, which is a study that I now manage, took over from Dick Potts. And that started in 1968. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in depth, what the study is, why, we, why it was useful to have one of our landowners on the area actually decide to do something for gray partridges. And I have to say that that was due in a large part to Dick Potts, who if any of you have met him, um, he sadly passed away in 2017. He was Dr. Partridge and he really made a difference to a lot of people's lives and a lot of Partridge's lives. And then finally, I'll touch just on a project that's about to come to an end, which is the North Sea Interreg Partridge Project, um, which is a demonstration project across Northern Europe, not unfortunately in Finland, but we can try in the future. Um, and just some preliminary results there. I don't want to say too much, um, but suffice it to say that it is harder to get very partridges back than we would hope, but then, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And then also just touch a little bit on some of our citizen science projects, which we are trying to use in the UK to get farmers and landowners to take an interest in gray partridges, and once they take an interest in it, to start to address what they can do on their farmland. Some of that has worked well, some has not. So first of all, the Salisbury Plain experiment, and this happened before I started at the Trust, because I started in 95, and this happened before then, so this is like our history. And it was a predator control experiment. So um, the predator control was directed during the nesting period. It was only legal, but it was lethal means of control. And it was directed towards foxes, carrion crows, and magpies. And there was no change to the farmland management during this period. So this was strictly looking at predation control. Because at the time, there was a lot of controversy about whether it predation control was even useful for trying to get gray partridge numbers up. And it's a classic um, change experiment where you start off on doing management on one area and you leave the other area alone as the control and then halfway through the experiment you switch and you see if you can change the stuff that had happened on the uncontrolled or on the control plot to make it up to what was happening on the managed plot. Okay, this is a classic way of, it's a landscape level. It means that you don't have, um, you have only one experimental um, unit to compare with, but it's a good way of looking at these kind of landscape questions. And the importance is the switch over. So in 1984, um, when a lot of you weren't even born, uh, I think, in this room, um, uh, we did the, the guys started doing survey work at two areas on the Salisbury Plain. And I should say something about Salisbury Plain, which is an area north of where we are, about an hour north of the Trust. And it is an area that has some really amazing um, chalk grassland left. And it's left because it is also one of the big training areas for the military in the UK. So that means that the farming isn't very intensive, which is one reason why they didn't do much habitat management at that time. Okay, so, and it still is owned by farmers. Farmers own all of it, but they, le they lease the land to the military, and the military goes across with its tanks and it blows things up, but not partridges usually. Um, so the maps I'm going to show are this, the style where the squares are barren pairs and the triangles are single males. Obviously we're counting in the autumn, so we're counting young, and the size of the circles is the number of young in the cubby. Um, I'm assuming you know something about gray partridge ecology, but maybe just a minute here, which is that the family groups stay together into the autumn, which makes them really useful for measuring productivity through the summer months. So, and in those coveys, those are family groups, you can count males and females and number of young. And if you know what you're doing, you can age the young as well. So you get an idea of when they came off the nest. That gives you an idea about uh, survival rates. Um, and it also, if you back calculate, gives you an idea about the brood production because we've got some calculations we use from tracked birds that we assume to be the case going forward. 
I won't go into that, but if you are interested, I have lots of papers that you can sit and look at some nice formula. Anyway, at the start, at the baseline, both of these two areas were similar in terms of the density of birds. So, ah, so in 1984, was the next year was the experimental phase, and Milston didn't have a gamekeeper on it, but Collingborn did for three years. And this is what you get. Uh, 318 birds counted on the area that had the gamekeeper on it, and only 80 on the area that didn't. And if you notice, there's a lot of barren pairs and single males, which shows that we've lost a lot of those young, either directly when they were chicks or on the nest. And then we switched for the next three years. I put the gamekeeper on Milston, which did really well, especially in the last year, um, and took the gamekeeper off of Collingborn. The same gamekeeper, the same methods of control. Um, and if you want to read about it, and I'm going to leave these slides with Heidi, and you'll have it on the film, um, the, the um, papers that came out of that, the big ones, are there. And the other thing that happened at the end of that time is there was also a shoot. So we were able to show that um, the landowners could sustainably shoot birds. So that proved, well, it, it indicated that predation control was useful to try to restore numbers of bird partridges. Oh, and I should say that um, <coughs> in typical fashion, because we never lose any data, hopefully, at the Game of Wildlife Conservation Trust, we look at the hare numbers as well. Jonathan Reynolds, who's just recently retired from the trust, led that. And he used some of the data that we've collected from different um, restoration projects to look at the numbers of hares on keepered and unkeepered areas, and of course found that there was a positive effect. So if you're interested in brown hare, that's a useful paper. So the next demonstration project, and this is another one run by the trust. So the Salisbury Plain experiment we paid for that keeper. And in this one, we paid for that keeper. Interestingly, this, is nor this took place north of London, just so you can orient yourself. Um, this started in 2002. It's the same keeper uh, from the Salisbury Plain experiment. He was employed by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust for most of his professional career, actually, just recently retiring. He was exceptionally professional in his outlook as a gamekeeper goes, and you could trust him to only do the lethal legal means, but not go beyond that. So it's important when you're working with gamekeepers to know that you're dealing with uh, professionals like that. And so what this was, was we had the keeper, and the keeper worked with the farmers to get some habitat management going as well as just predation control. So this is bringing everything to bear. And we also brought in supplementary feeding from October to March as well. Now, supplementary feeding is a little bit controversial because we have not managed to do what I would call a really good experimental de design um, test of it. Because every time we try to do it with gamekeepers, they decide that halfway through the um, experiment, they're going to all start feeding. And it gets very difficult to hold the controls. Um, but there are also problems with it. And, um, and I don't know if I will speak about it too much, but the issue becomes is you have problems with rats particularly. So if you do not have somebody who can handle that problem, you know, a professional gamekeeper can do this, and you also bear in mind that you need to move those feeders, you need to make sure you're trying to minimize the amount of rats particularly, um, they can cause just as much trouble as good. So I think we should be open and fair about that. So the, the demonstration area was the area in the middle the red area, and the reference area was on either side, and they were right next, nor next door to each other. It's not really probably what you would want to do. You would want to have at least a kilometer, if not more. Um, and we have in other projects. So again, everything's thrown at it. And the way we managed to get it to bring up the habitat, so if you think that um, if the 60 hectares here, that's about six of a hundred or a thousand hectares and then the same for brood rearing habitat so we put in nesting habitat and we put in brood rearing habitat the farmers did some of this off their own back without being paid 
but most of it was paid through either agri-environment schemes or set-asides. And of course, we lost set-aside halfway, or almost at the end of this project, in 2007, 2008. And some of that habitat went to law. We lost it completely. And I think that's affected numbers for some time after that. Anyway, this is how we managed to get it going. The most important thing that we think in this habitat uh, presentation is the broodering habitat because our information on chick food indicates that it's the chick food that's particularly limiting in agricultural areas. Again, the normal fox, mustelid, and corvid control legally done. This is a larson trap um, that the gamekeeper used. And again, this managed to bring up on the demonstration area. These are the spring counts. And we had predicted, based on the habitat structure, the landscape structure, that we could get up to around 20 pairs per, per 100 hectares. And it was nice to see that that kind of level was where we were at. Um, and then autumn counts. And this was enough to do some shooting through the years. So we were up somewhere around, at the highest, I think it was just nearly 90 birds per 100 hectare in the autumn. And not only did the gray partridges react, we also had increases both in pheasants and in red leg partridges. These were not released. None of this was released on the area when we were working on it. Um, there was releases going on on the sides, and some of that would come in, but also there was production of young within this area. And um, we find it easier to get pheasant numbers up um, relatively. And towards the end of the project, the pheasant shooting was going on with another organization. So our pheasant bags were actually only a small part of what was being produced on the land. And if you want more information, there's more papers there for anyone who wants to go and look. And then the longest data set on impact of farming in the flora and fauna of arable lands is the Sussex study that we manage in Sussex, which is a county in southern England. And you can see where it is, down almost on the coast. From the hills on the top, you can see the sea. And it started off in 1968 looking at the decline of gray partridges. And that's when Dick Potts first came to the Game Conservancy Trust, or the Game Conservancy as it was then. Um, and he started monitoring arable flora in the cereal fields, the insects and invertebrates in the cereal and also looking at crop rotation and pesticide use. And that's probably the bit I did the most on um, because I did some analysis on pesticide use in those areas that I'm not really going to talk about today. So this is um, gray partridge spring pears. And you can see, if you look at this, if you, I didn't put 68, but if you went back into the 60s, the density was much higher. And then as agriculture started to intensify, um, they dropped down. In the mid-1970s, two things happened. One was we joined the Common Agricultural Policy, um, and everybody ripped out hedges and, and banks, and that was terrible. And the other thing was, is that's when we started to see a lot more use of insecticides in those cereals. Um, and, you know, major use of, of aphicides that are pretty nasty. And then things went okay, then there was a big use, all the way along here there's use of insecticides, and then in here we started to see use of two or three um, insecticides in the summer, which is particularly damaging to insects. I do not think in Finland that you have that amount of intensification. <coughs> I hope you don't. And so, um, that was, we were looking pretty bad actually, in 2003, when we counted, because we go over and count gray partridges every autumn, there's a whole team that go, we had counted um, only about 100 birds on the whole of almost, I think we were counting about maybe 36, 40 square kilometers at that time. So things were not looking very good. And this is what it looked like. And Dick, we finished the last day of count, and he went to go see the landowner who owned this orange bit. Um, who's the Duke of Norfolk? Often, you know, these big aristocracy people have a big hunk of the, of the farmland. And he told him, 
that if he didn't do something, there were going to be no partridges on the South Downs in probably less than five years. That they might hold on down here in this low area, which is an area that has <coughs> traditional rotations. So that's where you've got a lot of spring barleys that are undersown, that are followed by very low intensive agriculture. But other than that, we thought they'd go. There were um, 13 partridges left on his area. So there was that covey up there, and there was one single male on that, on that field up there. Just a tiny little dot. And, it, and you know you're in trouble with partridges if you see single males in the autumn. They just do not like to be on their own. They're an unhappy bird. So what happened? I'll show you 2020. It wasn't the best year. I think we had about 800 birds on that area where we had 13. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and the first thing that I should say, in 2003 and 4, they put in efforts to put in habitat. And they also changed their farming. But the, before we go any further with what they did for habitat, what they did after they had that was they brought in nine wild pairs. They translocated them in the spring. We think that if they hadn't have done that, it's unlikely that this would have worked because there was such a low density at that time. Um, but going on from there, what they did was they, they broke up fields, they put through what I will show you soon, beetle banks and et cetera associated with all of that new boundary. They stopped farming in these big monocultures. So you can see even though the fields are very big, they also tended to farm all the same crop. The red is winter wheat, um, the light blue is spring barley, the dark blue is winter barley. And of course at that time, we still had that set aside, which is this maroon color, but we lost that. So they changed that farming style, and there is no support for this kind of thing in agri-environment schemes. It, it's a difficult thing to try to get someone to do because you have to move your uh, farm machinery from one end of the farm to the other and then go back again for the next crop or do the same when you're trying to do any treatments on the field. It is a difficult thing to do. Farmers don't like it, but we think it's particularly important because during the nesting or when you're bringing birds off or when the birds are looking for any kind of cover, they've got different crops on either side of all the boundaries. So there's a good chance they'll have some kind of cover and they'll have something that they can feed on. Okay, so that's one thing, again, done with no support. The next thing they did, they do get some support for. So they put in beetle banks on all those divisions of the fields. And on some of them, as in this picture, they've planted new hedges, which is, they've got some support, but not all support. And they've put in conservation headlands. So the field sizes are roughly about 10 hectares. So compared to some of your fields here, that seems very large, but in the UK, it's not. Um, and remember, most of these are cut in half, so they were about 20. And then around the field, they selectively spray. Most of these are low nitrogen. They have a very reduced um, herbicide regime. They have absolutely no insecticide. And it's been amazing in terms of uh, arable flora that comes up. We have not had to plant anything. It's all still in the seed bank, even after 40 years of very intensive agriculture and plowing. The plowing might help a bit. Um, so what does it look like if we look at 2003 on one side and 2020 on the other? Um, the beetle banks have gone in pretty much all the way around. Um, we've got conservation headlands coming in on at least one side of those beetle banks on every cereal field. They have conservation headlands. And then we have wild bird cover strips, and these are things like chicory, kale, and that's evolved what those are, are what actually is in those as composition. And those are put in usually on the other side of the conservation headland. It's difficult to see with the map, but um, if you add it all up, we've got about 9% of the farmed area in conservation headland. Not all of that is, given, is funded through the agri-environment scheme because the owner, landowner does some off of his own back. It does help to be the Duke of Norfolk. We are not saying that every farmer could do this. They've put in about 25 kilometers of beetle bank and hedges. Some of that 
is funded, some is not. The underzone spring barley tends to be funded. There is a way of funding that through agri-environment scheme. And that means if you're undersowing spring barley, you can't use the kinds of herbicides you would that are really take out the arable flora. When we do um, look for arable flora, those fields are always really interesting, even into the middle of the field. And a lot of times where we find quail and other kinds of very interesting varmint birds, they're in those fields. Um, there are overwinter stubbles that are kept so that there's cover over winter. Um, and then, of course, there's 21 hectares of these strips of wild bird cover. And they've evolved through time on what they're actually planting in there. They started off with kale, chicory, canary grass. And now they're moving to some of the more, what I would call, modern mixes, which are being looked at in the Partridge Project across the North Sea. So I'll go into those in a minute. And then they're also putting in feeders. They, they aim for one feeder for every partridge pair, and they feed through, they do try to keep the feeding going through the whole year. Um, but it falls off in the summer, really, when the birds don't really need it, because there's plenty to eat. <laughs> and the other thing they're doing is they're doing uh, predation control, and that's trying to up the brood production. And of course, there's two ways to do that. You can e increase the nesting habitat, and you can take out the predators. And of course, I've shown you they've already done the nesting habitat, and now they're doing the predation control as well. Um, the idea is that you need, to, you need to get up into this kind of area, if you think about it as sort of a system. Um, and all of the ones, the remainder of the area, are still only producing about 61% reproduction rate. Right? That's not bad, really, compared to an, if they are basically unkeepers. Um, but 84% includes some one year that was particularly bad production, which was in 2012, where we had a really wet, rainy June, particularly when uh, gray partridges really hatched their young. Um, and that, the rain acted like a predator. It, it killed birds left, right, and center. We had only a 12% chick survival, which is way below what you need to re um, replace numbers. <coughs> And so this is what we've got. Um, we're a little bit shaky, I would say is the right word, about these numbers here. Because at, at the beginning of when we started counting, and of course the gamekeepers are counting as well, in the Sussex study we've traditionally counted over each area once. Whereas the gamekeepers go three times over the same area. And it probably means that we, we were estimating in the beginning of this, in the 2010s, we were counting about 75% of the birds they were counting. Our estimates are we're probably doing closer to 50 right now because there's just so much cover. But we daren't change our methods that have been happening since 1968. So we're in a bit of a crosshairs of the situation. Regardless, you know, numbers are really up on what they were. The, the Duke has managed to have shooting for um, since about 2008. He did a little bit of shooting, and then from then on, except for 2012, he's shot gray partridges sustainably every year. And he sells that shooting for about 30,000 pounds for a day. One day. Um, it's a pretty impressive day. I've never seen so many keepers in my life, because I've gone along on one of these. And everybody from all over comes just to see all of the gray partridge, because it's such a tradition. Um, and usually the people who come to shoot are kind of fam famous as well, so could be some of that too. <laughs> and along with the gray partridges, those kind of, yes? yes how about truly have you plan, plan to an article <laughs> by type of the importance of aristocracy in the nature conservation? We have not. Um, there has been made by some reporters have made this discussion, particularly in the shooting press, because there is, um, there was an article about all of the dukes who own either really famous gray partridge manors, as we would call them, or other kinds of, of traditional shooting areas that require taking a cut in their agriculture payments, because it really does. Um, not that they're worried about money, I'm sure they're not, but I mean, they also value gray partridges, as the duke does. Um, so red-listed arable flora, all of those conservation headlands have amazing things in them. It, it's gone from being able to do the weed um, identification and uh, counts from two days into three. 
So it takes me much longer to go and stand in a field and try to identify everything because <laughs> there's just so many things in there. But that's quite useful. Um, that's valued by lots of conservationists, not just shooting conservationists. Insects is a slightly different, or invertebrates are a slightly different story. So on the top is comparing the, the remainder and the managed before the par partridge project, the peppering project started, and that below is after. And you can see it really only had an effect, significant effect, in two of the chick food um, insect groups. So it's more difficult, it's much more difficult to get insects going in those conservation headlands now. And if we compare it to the mid 80s when a lot of the first research was done on this, mid, well, 90s, mid 90s, um, we do feel like it's, we've gone through so much intensive agriculture, but getting the insect numbers back is harder. I, we really do think that this is a case of that. Um, <clears throat> but we have to remember that they're not just getting their insects from the cereal fields anymore. We have all this wild bird cover, which we haven't been sampling. But I will just say, mention a few things in the Partridge Project, the North Sea one. The other thing is um, Dick Potts, before he passed away, did uh, breeding bird surveys on the area. And you know the usual culprits have all increased. So skylarks, although since Dick finished, they might be coming down a bit because of all those hedgerows, and they're not quite sure that we're, they're as happy with all those hedgerows. Lapwing pairs, and the area which is, and I may not have said this, is 10 square kilometers, it's 1,000 hectares. It holds half the breeding pairs of those in the South Downs National Park. So it's a very important area for lapwing, and we have a PhD student working on the lapwing there. Linnets, yellow hammers, and particularly corn buntings as well, which we consider kind of a little gray partridge. Their, their requirements are very similar. And if you wanted to look at some uh, publications, there's a list there for you. Um, and yes, we've just submitted the last one. I've just submitted what might be the last one with Dick Potts. Um, which is a long-term trend in invertebrate paper that he was involved in discussion before he passed away. All right, and the last one, the last demonstration project, is one that's going on right now across the North Sea area in Europe. And um, so the little map on the side shows the North Sea area. Notice Finland, unfortunately, is not in it. Um, and we've got two demonstration sites in each of five countries. So that Scotland and England are considered separate countries. So that was lucky for us. Um, and then Belgium, and the Netherlands, and Germany. And with each of these demo sites, there's a reference site. And um, <coughs> what we're trying to do, it started in 2017. The aim is to get 30% more biodiversity at these demo sites by next year. And we've done a bit of monitoring. <coughs> and the things that we're monitoring are, and I'll try not to forget any, we are monitoring brown hair using transex. We are monitoring on some of the sites wintering songbirds. We are monitoring breeding uh, birds on all of the demo and reference sites. And we're, of course, monitoring gray partridges by several methods. So we use call counts. We use, in those areas like the UK, where we have traditionally done the stubble counts, we use those. And in some of the European countries where they haven't done those additional stubble counts, they're trying to do an estimate for chick survival um, using driven counts and trying to find at least 10 coveys so that they can get an estimate of how good chick survival was for a summer. Because it's a good way of monitoring how much insect food might be available to the partridges there. And then there are little projects going on looking at insect numbers in different habitats across the area. And of course we're mapping all that, that's my team's job. Um, to make sure that we're getting that habitat into the area. So again, they're all tailored to the gray partridge, all of the habitat management that we're doing. And it's based on scientific evidence. And I don't know, Heidi, you have a copy of the farming with nature that we've done, and it's possible to download this. And <clears throat> there will be a German version coming as well, if anyone's interested, and that's on the website. And we tried to summarize both all of the things that we've learned in our demonstration projects and in other people's research, looking at the habitats that we put in for gray partridges. What are the effects for brown hair? What are the effects for insects? 
for harvest mice, all of these things. We're trying to summarize that in this document. Um, it's really useful from the point of view of giving to policymakers so that they know what, what has been shown to be positive with that habitat management. But the big thing we're trying to do and the thing we're leading on and trying to get into um, all of the AES agri-environment stewardship or agri-environment plans in all of those countries is um, this wild bird cover. Now it's not the only high quality habitat measure that we're putting in. Um, there are other things like the first beetle banks was put in in Belgium and the Netherlands through this project. Um, and in, we've got people in the Netherlands putting in hedgerows that they've not had before. I mean, it's really unusual for them to see a hedgerow in the Dutch countryside. Um, but the big one we're leading on right now is these wild bird covers. And most of them are not traditionally what you might think for shooting. They're really um, oriented towards trying to provide chick food insects. So there are around 30 species in this mix. And we try to have about, well, we've got in the UK, we've got 19 of those are native species. They're very hard to come by. They're more expensive, um, but they do much more for wildlife. And the other thing that we try to do is we try to have them in the ground for a long period of time so that they cost more to establish through management and doing mowing and, and maybe some scarifying through them. We keep them going for more years. So the investment pays off by having a longer um, time period on them providing something for partridges and other farm and bird. And they're beautiful as well. I mean, we, the, the fellow in Germany, one of them, is right next to a major or to a fairly large university town, and when his wild bird covers are in blossom, which happens a lot, he gets people just coming out from town to have a picnic by the side of the field because it's just trying to pick them. That's the other thing that's not so good. But anyway, yeah, they do get quite a bit of attention. All right, and these are two from from Rotherfield. The other thing that happens is on those areas where we can. We do lethal, legal, legal predator control. And on other areas where they cannot do it during the breeding season, they do try to do something to, that's not lethal. So there's either, there's some um, fencing going on around areas where there are nests and no nests, because there is volunteers who help on some of the Dutch side flying nests. Um, and the other thing that happens in particularly the German sites and now the Belgian sites are looking at this, is trying to make the plots wider more than 20 meters in width. And so they come across as blocks. And then the management takes place half, and then you, you turn, and then you do the other half. So you end up with quarters of different ages of habitat. Um, with the idea being that it's the things that are around producing insects in June that are important both for gray partridges and for farm and birds who rely on insects for their chicks. And so this is, this is the data from Rotherfield, which has been going on a bit longer. And there we have this, all this management is going on in support of really great partridges. But they have shown that they've got higher numbers of breeding songbirds across the area, and particularly associated with a lot of those wild bird covers. Um, and preliminarily, this is stuff that came out of the meeting last week. Um, they've start, we've started to have the partners who are doing the analysis, which is INVO in, Bruff, in Belgium, um, look at whether we're getting an increase in farmland birds. And it's difficult, of course, because you've got a very small time frame to try to find a difference. Something like only five years, which is almost impossible. But there's, there's really three of the farmland bird species that we're looking at seem to have increased in that trends on across all areas, if you, if you look across all areas. That's tree sparrow, linnet, and the greater white throat. And then if you compare early years to later years, so not looking at a trend, but just comparing early and late in the management, then you find 10. So there's those three already, plus the, the black-tailed godwit, the goldfinch, gray partridge, that's always GP, um, lesser white throat, lapwing, skylark, and yellowhammer. This is a slide that if you send this, the slides around, please take it off because it's all preliminary. And the next step is actually, we've got transects, of course, that is this analysis is being done. And we want to start bringing in our, our amounts of high quality habitat as a covariate to see if that 
relates better. Yeah, I think that's where we are. And of course, it's all bottom up. So whereas the other projects were either one stakeholder doing it, one farmer who had a lot of money, or us as an organization coming in and paying for things, um, we are paying for some things through the North Sea. So we're paying for some of the management. Um, but we, it's a much more bottom up approach. So the farmers are actively involved in making decisions. The hunters help the farmers with some of their predator control where they can do it and also other things. We've got farm advisors who are actively involved in trying to get the best out of that habitat management, those wild bird covers. There's us as NGOs. There's BirdLife Netherlands is actively involved. We've got scientists and universities coming out. We've got local, regional, and national authorities visiting. And there's a real push on trying to get people out onto farmland, not just farmers, but the local people coming out to realize what's going on on the ground next door to them where they live. And that's important. So that leads very quickly onto citizen science. And the concept of where we, we see this going is a more stakeholder involvement in citizen science. And that's the idea about behind, we consider adaptive management sort of way of thinking about this, where the local landowner or shoot manager does the management, they must be involved in the monitoring. They must know what their management is producing and then we can help them adjust their management based on those, that monitoring. And then you just repeat. The idea is it becomes a real circle that gradually starts to improve conditions and responds to some of the things that happen once you start to do this kind of conservation. Like you find out that there's a weed problem in one field. And you have to go and deal with that and try to move things around. That thing, that's the sort of thing we have in mind. So, we have two things, the Partridge Camp Scheme, which has been going since before the Second World War, um, which at that time was directed towards what were called Partridge Manors. And those are people, those are estates that have traditionally had great partridge shooting. And then recently we've upgraded that. And then there's something that uh, my, our advisory team would just like us to mention, and that's the Big Farmland Bird Count, which has tried to take the whole concept of farmers monitoring wildlife on a bigger scale than the Partridge Camp Scheme. Okay, so if a farmer joins the Partridge Camp Scheme, they will have heard of us through the press, maybe our advisory team have had a visit there for something, and they've said, would you like to join this and count your partridges? They get a lot of information when they join. And um, this is to try to make sure that they're all educated to the same level of what they're going to need to do with partridges. Lots of people know it, some people don't. Um, so we have uh, loads of fact sheets, hands out on how to go about it, how to identify chick food. So if you have, we encourage farmers and gamekeepers to get a butterfly net, an insect net, and go out and sample and see what's actually in the things that they think are producing insects. Because sometimes they find out there isn't much there. Sometimes they do. The other thing we do is we try to give each farm or estate a target. So what's the number of partridges if I do all the things right that I could have, especially most of these guys will start off with some partridges. They're not places that have nothing. And this is based on a publication called Question of Balance that Steve Tapper, I don't know if people know about him, but he worked at the Trust. He was the editor for and we produced back in 99. It's roughly still correct, um, but the satellite imagery has changed, which my team uh, works on. So if you have a basic sort of um, outlook, and this, the, this one here has a basic. Um, if you're an optimal square kilometer, we would expect you to have four pairs of partridges. And if you're a suboptimal, you would have two. So we can give you the basic number that we would expect. And this farm would expect 12 pairs. They don't do much. If they put in the best habitat, you can double that. So that would be 24. If you put the best keepering, you could triple your 12, but no habitat, and that would give you 36. If you do the combination, you take it times six. So that's how you really get your increase in numbers, is bringing those two things together at the same time. Now, not everybody can do that, and that's okay. We don't ask everybody to be a Duke of Norfolk. They just can't. But they can look after their basic 12 pairs. And so that's the way we're starting at this. And then, 
We teach them, if they don't know how, um, how to do counts of gray partridges, both in the spring and in the autumn. Um, and then from that, they go out, do their counts, send the information in. We send back to them calculations, like what's your spring pair density? Um, what's around you? What are the other sites around you producing? Um, what's in the autumn, we can tell them about their chick survival rate. If that's low, below 33%, then they need to up their brood rear and cover. If they've got a brood production rate problem, they need more nesting cover or they need to consider game keeping. And then overwinter survival, which tends to be on average only about 50% in the UK, how could they maybe get that up? You know, could they put in some overwinter stubbles, et cetera? And then of course there's the social aspect and the training and learning aspect. So there are county groups set up of these guys. They're ten, they tend to be guys, but not all. Um, and they can get together from farm walks, barbecues, and our advisory team and some of our staff always go along to help with some more education. So the idea is that it's always trying to bring forward and have people think about gray partridges along with their farming. And so these are the numbers that have been in there. These were all the partridge manors before. So there's roughly between 100 and 200 always counted every year. And we had a big expansion um, at the beginning of 2000. We got up to about 1,000 returning farms and estates returning counts. And now that's fallen back to about 500. But it's still a lot of effort from farmers throughout the country. The question is how, what has been happening. And we've had some early success. So around about 2010, and if you remember from the previous slide from the Duke of Norfolk, that's when we had some really good numbers in Sussex as well. The agri-environment scheme options at that time were particularly good. They supported all of the, in something called the higher level scheme, they supported all the stuff we would advise. The wild bird cover that had a, a, a wide number of species in it, the conservation headlands, the beetle banks, they were all given good support. Since then, not so good. And also, um, in 2012, we had that horrific year, which knocked numbers down across the whole country. And it wasn't just gray partridges, it was farming birds in general. That was a horrific year. And the worry we have is what the future holds with climate change. Are we going to continue to get those years? <coughs> and since then, we've had some building back of numbers, but really not to the point that we were at, at around 2011, 2012, before the rains came. And finally, as I'm probably running past what Heidi thought I would do, um, is the big farmland bird count. And this is sponsored by, we've got lots of sponsorship on this from the GW, through the GWCT. And it's encouraging farmers, land managers, and gamekeepers to count birds on their land in the winter. Because this is the time when their wild bird, some of their wild bird covers should be providing food, and some of them should be providing seed directly. And 2012 was its ninth year, and in 2021 we had over two and a half thousand people taking part. The, the results are just out yesterday, and it's more closer to 2,000 this year. So you, the last year was better, definitely. But it, we have something in the UK called the Garden Bird Count. You guys have that here. So this is the farmland equivalent, really. It happens roughly the same year, time of year in the UK, and it tries to get farmers to take more ownership over their management. And they go out for only 30 minutes. We train them on how to do this. We have training courses before. Um, and then everything is submitted online. And it gets them interested in what's out there. So um, these are some of the future considerations for gray partridges and then going on from uh, that to arable farmland. So first of all, with our partridge project in the interreg, is that 7% enough? That is the question. And that since we started partridge, there's been research looking at 10% maybe is needed. But for peppering and Rotherfield, we're looking more in the region of 14 and onward for the area that actually has habitat management. So it may be that we're just not at the right scale. We need more management, and we need to be willing to pay for it. So the first question is, can we improve the quality of it as well? And I think that some of the wild bird covers that we're using in Partridge are an answer to that, definitely. We need to have more diverse covers. 
And then, of course, there's the role of legal lethal predator control. And one of the things we did in Partridge was we did surveys of farmers and land managers across the, those five countries to find out what they thought about agri-environments, those who were and weren't in, to, in it, and what they would like to see. And we asked them, we asked the question, would you like more legal lethal predator control and actually have it funded through the AES? So you don't have to be a big farmer who can afford a gamekeeper to do this. That you could afford it through maybe a sort of ranger type of approach where a gamekeeper worked across many farms. And most of it, we got the biggest response with farmers really wanting that. So there is a desire for it. And we're starting to feel like in natural England, as we work with them, they're the advisory body to the government about what agri-environments to take into the new systems. They're starting to think that there is also a call for some kind of ranger who could do lethal control of certain pests and predator species. But it would have to be tightly regulated. And we agree with that. We're not in the business of doing anything illegal. But, of course, the legal system in the UK allows for a more um, control during the nesting season than other European countries have. And the other thing we think is that um, we think those land managers are key. We need to work from the bottom up. Um, we see the big farm and bird count to use that as a PCS, a partridge count scheme recruiting tool to address the decline in numbers. And then we also have something in the UK called farmer clusters, which came out of the peppering example that I, I spoke about peppering to a bunch of um, uh, government advisors. They decided to try to work, to get farmers to work across a larger area, because that was a thousand hectares. Um, and that has resulted in some funding support for that. And that's definitely uh, something we would like to see carried forward, because we think the only way to really adjust this and to attack it might be at that kind of at least a thousand, if not more, hectares going forward. And then finally, there's also looking for the future in the UK. We're looking at biodiversity and carbon credits, and those working through farmer clusters to ensure that the money that's provided for those, um, and we can talk about them later if you wish, that that money actually goes to the farmers themselves, not to any um, corporations trying to um, sell them. It needs to be the landowner who benefits. And finally, this is the team. And of course, it's the farmers, gamekeepers, landowners who are really key. And then these are the people who've worked on all the projects that I've, I've shown you. So the first of them, of course, is Dick Potts. And the first five people in the middle have all retired, and unfortunately, Dick has passed away. The next couple are looking to retire soon, and then there's the rest of us who are still got to keep going for a little bit longer. And I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, that wasn't too long. It was fine. It was fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you want to play this? Do you want to do questions now, or later? Or you want to discuss? talk about introduction of links, of rules, 
and we were telling we've been discussing this a little bit. But could, could uh, you repeat Johan's question because I think there's an it on the on the mic also. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, the question. Uh, let's see if I can succinctly. Think. Well, well, whether you have looked into predator dynamics, uh, what's what sort yeah. of predator dynamics to, to play with this? Yeah. So the yeah the question just for the recording is asking about um, have we looked at predator dynamics, um, particularly landscape level effects. Um, if I'm, I'll interpret that to say um, have we looked at how the removal of one predator affects the numbers of others um, or the population size of the, of the predators. Um, I would say not as much as we would like to. Um, we do look a little bit at the removal of red boxes and what that might mean for other mammals in the environment, um, but we haven't looked at too much at the effects on other predators particularly. And it likely is affecting everything. Um, the problem is, is that it's extremely difficult to keep box numbers down we can only really manage to do it during the nesting season with a very dedicated team. Um, because then everything goes back up to where it was before. Um, it's impossible really to eradicate. Uh, trying to think of other things that we've done. Nobody's really looked in too much depth as the, at the um, play between rabbits and predators really in our teams. That might be something as well. Rats and the feeding is a big issue. Um, so what has happened there is that the, the the issues to do with feeding not only bring in rats, but of course bring in aerial um, avian predators that are attracted towards the rats and then may also feed on gray partridge chicks at certain times of the year. But we've not looked at that too much either. So no, unfortunately not. Well, they can't do everything. No, we can't do everything. But we do have some projects looking a little bit at, at the dynamics of foxes right now, following with DNA. And it's particularly directed towards not gray partridge work. It's directed towards the release of pheasants. Because, of course, when we release pheasants in the UK, we release a lot. Uh, or some estates release a lot. Um, perhaps more than we would advise. And the question is now, how does that affect the red fox numbers? And so we right now have a project working with a, a PhD looking at the DNA of that. See if we can separate how many foxes are in the environment and look at how much pheasants they're consuming, how many other things they're consuming, and measure those things in the environment as well. So it is a fairly large project involving our pheasant ecologists, some of our farm and bird ecologists, and our um, predator mammal ecologists. So that, it has just started this year, unfortunately. <laughs> We don't know what's going on yet. Yeah. <clears throat> I always see that the problem here, when, thank you for the nice nice example of the habitat management thing when you have lots of beetle uh, banks and uh, yeah. all kind of di diversity uh, sites and, and stripes and everything. I wonder. The question for the film is how much does it cost to do the things similar to what the Duke of Norfolk has done with all of his stripes. Um, and, it, and it can be difficult when it's a stakeholder-led project. And that's the problem. We, we know somewhat what he gets for his, for his agri-environment scheme because you can measure it on the ground. And we know how much he gets for his, his shooting because he's told us. Um, he has never put any kind of mileage meters on his tractors. <laughs> he has never told us how much, I could probably, because he tells me his pesticide use, 
I could probably calculate that because it usually has it on the sh handout sheet that it gives me. Um, but I've never done this. Um, although I right now have a PhD student who's looking at network analysis, and we could layer on economics beyond just you know ecology. Um, but no, unfortunately, no one has done that. So it's very difficult to see. I think it's almost impossible that the government could support them, somebody to do as much as what he is doing. It's almost impossible. It has to be for the love. Yeah. It has to be for the love of Gray Partridges and biased and, you know, then leading on to that, it's the, the shooting that he is interested in as much as just Gray Partridges. Although maybe now he would do it even if he didn't get to shoot, but I think at the beginning it was definitely the shooting. Because it's such a, there are only very few estates that can do it sustainably. At the most 20, maybe only 10 on the average year. So it's a big thing. You know, and he goes to the Duke of Northumberland and they go shooting his partridges. Then they come down to Sussex, they shoot those partridges. They go to the Duke of Edinburgh or Prince Charles's estate in Norfolk and they shoot those partridges. So it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a, yeah. So we benefit from this in a way. I will pick up on this question. Now that you have the experience with Interreg project, of course yeah. you will be able to assess the actual costs of non-royal <laughs> non um, land managers yeah. and owners uh, in doing these things. And I guess in all agri-environmental schemes, anyway, the government assess the yeah. more or less approximated cost and income for gone. So it would be, of course, very important to know the percentage-wise what such landowners can recover from the public state and what is on their own back. Back, yes. Yeah. Um, I think that we can we can get we can recover numbers somewhat. We can't get this times six. That will never happen without that interest. But I think we could get the times four. I think we could get somewhere around there from the basic. Because we've shown it in some of our in some of our partridge count scheme members. They are not shooting and they still have managed to recover. But they need that higher level scheme, mm -hmm. which is no longer the case now. Even, it wasn't even before Brexit had finished, um, before we'd left, it was the, something called the countryside stewardship and it was not as good. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't didn't allow for the kind of layering on top of each other of the habitats, which the original higher level scheme. But the higher level scheme required um, the landowner to probably purchase some advice. So to get somebody to come out onto their ground and help them make decisions about where to put this and how much to put. Mm -hmm. And the government didn't like to, didn't like to support this advice. Um, so yeah, I also think looking at the interreg it is much more difficult across Europe. There are certain places where, and, and I worry that we are going to get the numbers up and not be able to sustain once the project goes. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying desperately to do is to get particularly those wild bird covers because we can take maybe one or two. So we've got the beetle banks and the hedgerows that we want to take into, make sure those are supported in the future and these wild bird covers that are quite diverse. And if we can take those two things in, then we think we might be able to sustain numbers after the project leaves, as long as there's support from the government for the extra cost of those wild bird covers, because they do cost more, mm -hmm. a lot more, compared to a cheap maze or something. Do we have time? One, one, one quick question. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No, but um, that, that's very interesting. It's certainly very relevant. I mean, I, I have experience with those uh, diversified uh, things and otherwise. Uh, they do cost a lot. Mm they often, farmers don't know how to use them, how to manage on what soils, so the success rate can be appalling. Yes. They sow, nothing happens, only weeds, they get they give pissed up, up and, yeah. yeah they give up. And the seed mix sometimes comes from abroad, like Holland, yes. um, and so longevity is very compromised because two years and nothing anymore grows there. So what is the possibility of like self-regenerating fallows, like you just leave a fallow that a was partridges used to benefit from in the past. Um, I think it, 
in, in Sussex, where we have all this nice chalky soil, mm. and we have a good seed bed, and we have interesting things in it, and, there, and you get some really nice, interesting fallows. Maybe you need to do some tickling of the soil and you yeah. know, get things coming up. They could be useful. Um, in, the, in the Netherlands and in Belgium, the soil is just, just hardly anything left. If you just left it, you'd get thistles and, and um, it's just rubbish weeds that farmers hate. Mm. And it's not necessarily that the weeds are bad for partridges or for wildlife. It's the way that farmers view them yeah. that's the problem. And I think that you cannot, these, these more expensive wild bird covers, I do think that it's worthwhile the government also provides advice. Because that's one thing that the Partridge Project is doing continually. There is always someone they can talk to. If they've got a problem, they call somebody up, they come out and they try to deal with an issue of it. They make decisions, they get derogations from the government for withholding, stopping planting until the conditions are right. Because there's no reason to be forced to go out and plant something because it's the 30th of April and you have to have it in the ground. If it's not going to germinate, why bother? You just need to wait. Yeah. And um, the only reason that that happens in the Interreg project is because we have the government working with us, um, BLM and, and um, Natural England and people like that that we can call up and say, this is not gonna work, we need to do something. And your average farmer finds that difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there needs to be more joined up more talking to each other. Okay. Now we thank you, Julie. Yeah, thank you. For a very, very thorough and very interesting presentation. Uh, sorry, we are we are late from the schedule, but that's yes. actually my fault because I, I forgot the academic quarter in from the beginning. But we'll continue with Alex and I think we'll just uh, start later with the luncheon because we will Emma will not be giving her presentation so if you keep hers and I think it's in the afternoon. It's in the afternoon, yeah. So we'll, we'll catch up. We'll catch up. So. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to give the talk here. So I'm going to talk about uh, how to measure changes in the biodiversity using, for example, the farming bird indicator as, a, as an example. So first of all, um, one big question, of course, is that why we are interested on monitoring the biodiversity in general. Of course, one reason is that we love it. Uh, there's definitely certain values. Look at the nice, beautiful crest of the lapwing, for example. There's uh, certain values that we just uh, uh, we just like, like to have in the, in, in our, around us. They are fragile. They're impressible. Uh, it's also our responsibility to take care of these these things. But we also need biodiversity. Uh, our, our kind of, uh, for example, food production is dependent on the ecosystem services that are produced by the, by the nature. So definitely people, people also need, need to have the biodiversity around us. And that's why uh, there has been a, a lot of uh, uh, international work also uh, comes to conventions, you know, for example, on the biodiversity, bi biological diversity and, and a lot of international meetings uh, aiming to certain targets and, and, and plans of how we should uh, uh, stop the decrease in the uh, decline in the, in the biodiversity on the global level. And of course there are certain targets um, on the international level, for example these IP, IP targets uh, that are, are certain, having certain kind of uh, uh, target timings when we should be able to uh, receive uh, these, um, these uh, targets, and and how to measure measure these. Uh, uh, one example, of, of course, is currently is the EU uh, EU uh, biodiversity strategy, which is currently forming up. And there, for example, the aim is to uh, to put put the uh, path to the recovery stage by the 2030. And of course, this requires a lot of actions and commitments, but also we need to have a tools to measure how actually the biodiversity is doing on, on, a, on a larger scale. So we need to have a tools how to measure the changes in the biodiversity. And of course, there's many different ways. We can just measure the species richness. We can use some kind of a diversity indices. We can take the arithmetic mean of the abundance indices of the, of the species. 
we can use geometric mean of the abundances or some other um, other indices. And recently, uh, recent work has been uh, putting a lot of effort on trying to find out what would be the most most efficient way and the most reliable way to do this. And, and geometric means of the abundance indices has been uh, the key way to move forward. And geometric mean mean basically means it calculates the uh, average uh, of the log, log of indices uh, for species and, and there's a certain equation to do that and the indicator which then summarizes the abundance in indices of, of the different species is the average trend of the relative abundance of the species concern. It's not the measure of the average trend of the population's concern so this is good to keep in mind. And uh, it's, it usually has a, has a certain base year, which is set to 1 or 100, and then the, if the abundances uh, of, of, uh, of a species, uh, one single species is increasing from 1 to 2, it means that it's, the abundance is doubled, or if the, uh, if the abundance is dropping from 1 to 0 0.5, it means that the abundance has been halved. And then when you summarize all these, you can, you can get a, uh, the indicator abundances. There has been also quite a lot of work on done on how to test uh, how different these kind of um, indicator types or biodiversity measures, uh, how sensitive, sensible they, sensitive they are for different kind of changes and how, how they can cope with kind of a, um, um, what we want to, so that the indices that we are using would be robust enough. So there's six different kinds of tests in this, this particular paper um, that they have looked at and how, how well the, these uh, different kinds of um, ways to measure um, biodiversity is, uh, is influenced. And you can see that the Jared mean is, is definitely the, uh, the most uh, suitable one uh, among these uh, five different options. So then one, of course, another big question is that uh, why birds would be a good indicators uh, for, for environmental change. There are several reasons for that. Um, birds are pretty sensitive to environmental changes, like we heard in the previous talk, that if we manage the uh, landscape differently, we can clearly see changes in the abundances. Birds are very well studied, so there's a lot of ecological work done on farmland birds, particularly in, in Europe, and so we definitely know a lot uh, how different kind of management actions are influencing species abundances. There's also a lot of uh, time series uh, based on the voluntary, voluntary common bird monitoring work uh, so that we can actually go back in time and have a look at the changes going on. And these surveys are repeated every year, so there's a lot of new information coming on uh, all the time. Birds are also pretty well known by common people and also politicians, so it's e much more easy to talk uh, on changes in the bird populations than for example some other taxa which is not, 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 not necessarily so uh, um, familiar to, to the people. People see birds all the time everywhere so that's a good, good way to communicate with the, with the many, many uh, birders, uh, of people who are not, not necessarily so, uh, so much familiar about the nature itself. But then if we go back to the, back to the actual uh, these indicators. Uh, this is an example from UK, so you can see the uh, farm and bird population uh, changes in different species. So in, in UK the farm and bird indicator includes 19 different species and you can see that there's a lot of variation between uh, in the population changes uh, uh, depending on the species. And But the red line shows the geometric mean which is kind of summarizing the overall changes uh, of these, uh, this group of group of um, species living in the, in the farm habitat. We have also done similar kind of work in, in Finland in different kinds of uh, habitats. Um, um, and here, here's an example from the forests. So uh, we have conducted forest bird indicator uh, both during the winter, winter season and in the breeding season. And they saw different kind of patterns. So in the winter time we see, we of course have a longer, longer time series as well. And uh, it's clearly showing a declining trend uh, uh, overall through the time. There's a lot of variation which is also linked with the crop sizes of, of tree species, so seed production, so that's causing some annual variation there. 
in the summertime it's more stable and uh, they are mm, perhaps perhaps birds are more sensitive to the habitat quality in the winter time than in the breeding time and this is by the way uh, also linked with the uh, PhD of the Sarah Price Edas who we actually sitting, sitting on uh, in the audience as well so um, great work from her in the past uh, also have, we have conducted similar kind of uh, indicator for peatlands in Finland but also for the northern Europe in general so 15 different species uh, this shows negative declines which is especially uh, caused by a drainage of, of peatlands and mires uh, historically especially uh, that the peatlands have been turned into a forest forest land and it's still going because the ditches are there and, and draining draining the habitat uh, unless they are restored and then we have the common bird indicator which is uh, based on certain selected sites which are where the survey sites are situated on the farmlands and you can see that they are mainly in the southern and western Finland uh, where we have most of the farmland, farmland areas. And like in the UK and in many other European countries our farmland bird indicator shows declines. So it's based on actually not 15 species but 14 species and uh, we can also split those into two different groups. We have the species which are breeding mainly in the open areas, so open, open land species, and then the edge species which are breeding mainly in the farm yards or in the, in the farmland edges. And they show clearly different trends, so species which are occurring on the open habitats um, are more in trouble than the species which are on the, on the edges. And it's also good to highlight that we have also, uh, even though farmlands are quite small proportion in Finland, in general, uh, compared to many Euro other European countries, for example, the curlews are quite important uh, on the, also on the European level. So more than half of the curlews in the EU are, are breeding in Finland. And our population is still doing pretty well, although there's slightly decline. But if you look at these, these sort of uh, trends, there's also a lot of variation behind them. So here are, here are all the 14 different species which are showing very different kinds of uh, population dynamics. So we can see quite a few declines but also increases. And currently we are working in a project uh, funded by the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry to find out also what kind of factors are actually influencing uh, population uh, development of, of these species. So trying to get a uh, doing some uh, literature search but also uh, also doing some uh, uh, analyses on the, on the monitoring data, why certain species might be responding in certain, yeah, certain ways and what kind of uh, management actions we should do to, to change the declining trends into more positive ones. So these were national examples, but we also have international uh, uh, indicators and, and these are in European level coordinated by the European Bird Census Council, uh, EBCC, and you can find more information from the website uh, from there. So EBCC has uh, three main projects. One of them is the Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Schemes, which I'm going to talk about more. Then there's also uh, European Green Bird Atlas, uh, EBA2, and the Eurobird Portal, uh, which, is, which are all aggregating a large number of information on the European level. So especially if you're interested on European level uh, data sets on birds, uh, these are very good options to keep in mind. So common bird monitoring uh, schemes are, are run in, in most of the European countries and this data is aggregated on, on annual basis uh, um, in, in, in the EPCC. And the main goal is to use birds as indicators to state of nature using uh, scientific data on the bird populations. And this requires, uh, of course, joint actions between the EBCC and BirdLife International, but there's a lot of other, other uh, national NGOs and, and organizations uh, uh, linked link on this. And it's uh, partly funded by the European Commission and the Royal Society of Protecting Birds from, from the UK. And of course, the most important thing is that it rel relies on the partnerships in each, uh, in all the European countries which are doing their own monitoring work, uh, aggregating the data and then sending that uh, to, the, uh, to the EBCC. Uh, the main office of the uh, Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring is placed in Prague in Czech Republic where this data is aggregated on, 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 on an annual basis. Um, so just 
tell a little bit about the process, how this aggregation work is done. So basically, uh, national level, there's monitoring going on, and, and, and the national coordinators are, are calculating uh, the, um, uh, the yeah, abandonment indices on, on the national level. But if we want to produce uh, an indicator on, it, on a large, large scale on the European level or, or sub, uh, supranational level, we need to first select the species and the habitat. So, for example, in farm and bird, bird case, uh, we want to ha select those species which are mainly occurring in farmlands in the tropical region. Then uh, we use the national uh, population indices that are calculated based on the uh, TREAM program, uh, which is also now available in R. So uh, it's a Poisson regression which uh, calculates then the annual abundance entities for all the species in the given, given habitat. Uh, then those national indices are combined as a supranational uh, in, uh, species in indices um, using the population sizes of the countries and the national population trends. So, for example, in Finland, where the curlew is a very important species, uh, curlew has more weight uh, than, for example, in, the, in the some other countries where the curlew is much more uh, scarce. So that's how we combine these population trends and the national uh, responsibilities uh, into uh, European-level um, population trends. And then those population trends uh, are then combined into European-level or regional indicators there's also sort of certain, certain regions within, within Europe, but we have, we have produced also the, um, in the EBCC the, the, the overall European level indicators. So it's a geometric mean uh, using the average species indices. And there's uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I saw that it all also um, produced um, an R tool, which is um, also using bootstrapping to calculate um, the confidence intervals um, for, for these um, indicators. So it's not only a single single line, but also there's confidence intervals uh, included and the un uncertainty behind the, behind the work. So all this information uh, from the uh, European level trends and, and indices are found on the PECAMS website, uh, available here. Uh, so there's all together more than 160 species uh, population trend information available for everybody. And how to combine then, here's an example of the, of the European farm and bird, bird indicator. So all together 39 uh, bird species are merged into one single indicator. And uh, then the, the main uh, wide bird index indices and indicators are, are produced by PECMS are shown here. So on the blue line you can see that all the common birds uh, uh, that are monitored uh, based on the PECM schemes. It's showing a moderate decline, um, whereas the, the forest birds are doing slightly better. There's only a slight decline, maybe 7% decline. But then the drastic decline occurs on the farmland birds. It has been, of course, historically uh, stronger, but uh, definitely it's still, it has still continued in recent years. So there's a lot of actions that needs to be done to reverse this on, on the European level. And also this information can be used to actually calculate how, how many birds we have actually lost in total. So if you then link the, in, uh, the population trends and the abundance estimates of the species, we know that there's, there has, there's a, how many millions of birds uh, that has been estimated to be on, on a European level and how much uh, uh, based on the calculations, the numbers have declined in recent years, or increases in some cases. And for example, in, in case of the Skylark, uh, there's a there's pretty good data set on, on a European level. We can see that there's a decline overall. Uh, of course, this is, a, this is a, uh, it's, uh, not up, up to date, but it shows that there's um, tens of millions of Skylarks lost uh, since 1980s. So as a conclusion, um, indicators are good tools to measure the success of the biodiversity targets. Uh, bird indicators are based on abundance changes 
uh, of species, uh, and there's a lot of scientific work done behind behind developing these indicator work. Um, and it, it's nowadays there's a good good ways to to also establish new indicators because of the early of knowledge. Uh, Palm and birds have been declining drastically in Europe since 1970s, so there's a lot of information on that. <clears throat> and and of course there's a lot of work done on, on basic research on how to different kinds of measurement measurement actions um, and management actions are can affect and pot potentially change the situation. And like we heard in the early talk, we can do this if there's enough political political kind of um, pressure to to actually change the ways we are farming the landscapes and, and also uh, how to support this on, on the economically. So I would really like to thank for you for listening, uh, but also the, the thousands and thousands of uh, individuals who have been uh, collecting the information and, and making this possible to, to, to do this kind of analysis on a European level. Uh, and also here I'll list some of the some of the collaborators on the, on the Finnish national level. And I would like to uh, end to the, to the motto of the, of the EPCC, so every bird counts, so we definitely need, need to have the, um, everybody counting the birds, but also uh, understanding that every single bird uh, in, the, in the environment is, is important. Thanks. to the UK, which is exceptionally doom and gloom, your indicators don't look nearly as bad, I would say. Is, um, do you think that's because, and I guess my appreciation has always been that the Finnish agricultural situation is not as intensive in its chemical inputs as what we have in the UK or even worse places, you know, there are worse places. Um, is that your reading of it or what do you think is the situation? We probably have a bit more better. There was somebody going to say something in a minute. Something okay. in, <laughs> Don't steal any thunder. In the, in the audience, but I, I think it's probably it's not as intensive as in many other countries in Europe, mm. for sure. Uh, the also perhaps uh, thing that we don't know too well is that how actually climate change might be benefiting yeah. the, the very northernmost population. Mm -hmm. So actually, even though some some negative actions might be kind of causing declines, the climatical conditions are supporting here. So that's something that we are starting to look now that um, are the Finnish trends overall better than, than the southern ones uh, and are they linked with the climatical niche of the species? Because that could be one of the reasons why why certain species are, are doing better here than, than, than elsewhere. That's right. Yeah, excellent. I mean, it will be very interesting to see. Yeah. As a small reaction to, to your comment, Axel. Of course, the, what is happening in the wintering grounds because of the climate change. Yeah. I mean, we basically lost winchets and meadow pipettes now. Mm. I mean, even in primer habitat, they yeah. just disappeared now. Yeah, yeah that's another, most of the, Finland is a cold country, so most yeah. of the, our farmland birds are migratory. So yeah. we are relying on actually the conditions in Europe or to actually in, in farming mm. Africa as well. So that's, that's also influencing the situation. Yeah. Yellow work team, just go on, go on. Middle pipettes are not doing so well. Yeah. 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 Yes, I have a related question that you, know, you come, come across cases where you see like uh, different trends in two species where you suspect that it's maybe because of happenings in, in, in the winter ground. You, you can say, or say much of the difference, like maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't done that much comparisons yet, but we know, for example, in Latvik and Curlew that the Finnish populations are actually doing much better than the Swedish and Norwegian ones. So even in, in the Northern Europe, European scale, we can see that there's differences between countries. And we don't actually know what are the reasons behind there. It, is it that they are, they are even more intensive in, in, in these other Scandinavian countries and in Finland, or if it's somehow climate-related? Or other birds wintering in different re different regions, perhaps, but uh, probably not. So yeah, we still know no answers to all these questions. I, okay. 
yeah. curlews are just declining very badly in the UK, mm. which is having hardly any production. But I think you have, they live on a different, because here they live on, on, on open farms. Yeah. Is it, it's sort of, you have, you have them on, on different Peatland, kinds, uh, yeah. peatlands. But they, they did traditionally also breed on open farming. Okay. And they're almost not doing that at all. And it, interestingly, the Duke of Norfolk is doing, uh, I can't really say too much, but there is some, some work looking at trying to reestablish an open farm. Okay. Yeah. So that's the this curly trend, so it's declined, but it's not, not very severe in, in general. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex, very much for a very interesting presentation. I hope uh, you also can use your slides. Sure. Thank you. And um, Irina, mm -hmm. it's your turn. Right. <laughs> yes. How many minutes? Yes, you can uh, keep your presentation. Don't, don't you be, we, we just uh, go to lunch a little later. I hope it's. So I hope it's. Yeah, I hope it suits <laughs> the others. actually something that came entirely on the initiative of the uh, DG environment and uh, it's been now for several years they were trying to launch it uh, not very successfully but finally two well, year ago um, a consortium got the funding for it so the idea is to develop tools to support farmland conservation bird conservation across the European Union so very briefly here how it's been going why and what's going to happen. So the goals of this initiative, well, quite obvious enough, is to try to solve this issue because public demands it. Birds are kind of on, on the media. There's a lot of uh, pressure politically. So they, they want to integrate the conservation needs uh, into farming practices. Well, lullable enough, understandable. It's not going because, happen because of researchers but because of land users, they want to uh, also reach some objectives of the political directives and also the most recent uh, uh, political agreements, such as Green Deal. They uh, wanted to build a community of authorities, experts, practitioners, very much what you were describing us as an example of a uh, partridge. Uh, the initiative covers 10 member states, uh, Finland is among them, and because the results are going to be available to all the European Union and I guess others who are not in the European Union. <laughs> and it's, um, it's a two year um, process ending the end of this year. And unfortunately, initially the, the Commission really wanted it to coincide with the uh, common agricultural policy strategic planning process. But because they messed it up, the money came far too late and the, this initiative started already rather late. It was very advanced negotiating process by that time and the capacity to influence national policy was quite limited because of this mistiming. But something uh, was we were able uh, to achieve and I will show you. So this is the project consortium very briefly. So quite a good representation across the different like regions. There are six uh, tasks there. Mm -hmm. Some of them basically kind of desk uh, study. So to review again, to synthesize what do we know about major agricultural systems that are relevant for birds. Mm -hmm. What are the flagship farmland birds? So how to focus um, then on more practical side is to provide concrete support to the member states in developing those conservation schemes. Uh, among how, to, how it was done were also uh, two national workshops in all those countries and also two EU level workshops, one of which is still ahead. There is of course communication work going on and the uh, kind of ambition is to further forced further collaboration around farmland birds among the stakeholders. 
So where we are now, basically, as I mentioned, the workshops have been done, a lot of desk study reviews uh, have been covered, and now we are basically in the finalizing the creation of those conservation schemes, of which there are two for each country, and then there will be still one EU workshop, and then sort of what to do next. So in Finland, um, I'm covering mainly Finland here, trying to focus really at, at, at this country. Um, so there were two workshops, and um, I mean, considering that farmland birds is not a big issue in this country, and farmland conservation generally is rather on the side with some other habitats, uh, I, I was quite pleased because we got really many stakeholders, all relevant stakeholders showed up, farmers, farm organization, producer organizations such as Valio and Arla and uh, both ministries, uh, all advisory bodies. So it, it was not bad considering all this. And it was very, very active work in many groups around specific issues. So we got lots of information about what should be done ideally. <laughs> so there were like really many pages of different ideas. Uh, so we looked at some good practices elsewhere that uh, are of use in Finland, including this Patrick work. Of course, Haiti was part of, uh, of those workshops. Uh, so also what can be done better to make those farmers, on, to get them on board, how to those, make those schemes more attractive. What, uh, what also, okay, maybe later. So the agricultural scheme, I was not part of this process very much. There was a other partner, but there was a, quite a big list of tasks how they were developed, like selecting the key agricultural systems. For Finland, the two were selected. One was mixed system of crop with significant natural vegetation and then non-irrigated annual crops. So this is EU level classification, quite broad. But then they took into account all those causes of avian decline and management options that are fitting to each of those systems and potential co-benefits also and what farmers might get out of it as well. And what are the knowledge gaps and so this is all done. Then the second was selecting those flagship species out of all the pool of farmland birds. Uh, so there are 81 species that are classified as cropland and grassland and then there were assessments of their threatened status, etc. And then, so out of all these 15 such flagship species have been selected and there were consultations on the national levels about whether this species are actually good as being those flagship. Because remember, it's not just science that had to be happy with it, but also practitioners. So can I relate to that species? And it's quite difficult. As he, I think, Heidi, it was your comment on one of the workshops saying that maybe we should talk about small birds on farmland rather than like wind chat. You know, the totality of just those small birds. Because for farmers, it's difficult, you know, to relate to any specific. So these are the 15 species they are covering the whole European Union. Um, there are several here, of course, as you can see, that are quite relevant for Finland. And so the, the people also in the project reviewing whatever information is available about this species and what can be done and how better to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm going quite quickly. <laughs> if, if, if it's too quickly, wave my hand because I'm trying to bring you to the lunch table on <laughs> time. So there will be a, a report, of course, in English, on major agricultural system. There will be fact sheets on those management options for each of those agricultural systems. There will be a report in English on those flagship species, and then there will be fact sheets on all. That's what the commission wanted. And then national language is also very simple flagship on all species. What can be done? Why, why to do it? Nothing totally a new, nothing totally exciting, but that's how Brussels works. Now, more interestingly, at least as I see it, um, is those conservation schemes work. Um, so there were two 
really concrete outcomes of one, one of which again is just another paper or PDF online, which is a fact sheet, or then in English and in national languages. And then the second is this ability to finally influence the common agriculture policy negotiation process with the commission being on board. So actually, you know, me and my colleagues talking to the commissioner personally on several occasions, what do we want them to tell our governments to do? And that's a unique experience because so far it's never been done. So it was always the government, agricultural ministry, not even environmental ministry, but agricultural ministry keeping the process in their own hands and talking to the commission and whether it's even telling anyone else about what's been happening or not. I see you are nodding your head, yes. yes. That's how it goes. So that was the first, and that's why I actually put aside some of my research work and teaching work because I saw a chance to actually finally <laughs> getting something done through this initiative. Um, so this, the strategic national plans have been through work um, last year and in summer there was a possibility to, hear, to give feedback on sort of public consultation and we've been in touch with all our experts for help, also using the workshop for ideas. We produced like about 30 pages of really detailed, scrutinized feedback on their suggestions, not only for birds, but also biodiversity. What is good, why is good, what is not, what can be improved, how to improve, why to improve, in what ways. Um, there were several issues of focus, because of course, as, as you may know, I don't know how much you know about policy, but it's a very complicated, complex um, policy document. Uh, we focused at several issues. One of those was something that in Finland we call nature management field, and this is basically a fellow. And we have four these types of fellow, just for your information. You. One is just grassland, but you are not using it for production. It's a normal grass mixed, and you just don't spray anything, and you just leave it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, you can actually take fodder <laughs> or pasture it, but no silage. Then the second is uh, like a meadow field, so it's a diversified seed mixture. Mm -hmm. Yes, then the third is game field, so it's a game, game targeted on game, uh, whether it's mammals or birds, but there are different uh, species that benefit them over winter then providing food. And there is even now fourth, which is called bird seed mixture. So even that was now. So this is possible to do. Um, so we were focusing on it because it's really been showing one of the most beneficial and wide-ranging schemes and farmers have experience with it and it benefits many species at the same time. Uh, one thing that we managed to do is that we asked our ministry through the commission <laughs> to increase the target because they, are, they wanted this target which is already achieved. You know, that's not an improvement, and certainly it was not enough to meet the 10% for nature objective at all. So I made the whole calculation to prove this point. So they increased the target. However, uh, if you have followed this, because of the war in my home country, Ukraine now, the commission is under huge pressure now from farmer lobby to abolish fallow full stop. So we already see farmers in Finland blowing up fallows as we speak, like last week for seeding started. So whether it's any, you know, that's how it goes in policy. You win, you lose. Um, so uh, another thing that we managed to change um, is that they, they again, change the uh, requirements for managing those farmers now that farmers have to mow them any time without any restrictions every year. And that, by that they simply create this ecological trap. You create a fallow, you invite all the birds to breed, and then you mow it in the end of June, beginning of July, of course, everything is killed. Also, bumblebees and whatever, I mean, there's no flowering plants anymore. And especially if they don't even collect the, the, the biomass, so you, you create this mulched field, uh, which, of course, we know from evidence is the worst possible way of managing a fallow. So that was uh, something we uh, also lobbied for, and that was now changed, uh, mowing every second year if the, farm, if the parcel survives. 
we also try to put into some more kind of uh, fine-tuned requirements of how to mow so that farmland birds are taken into account. But our ministry um, thought that was far too difficult and impossible to verify in field. So control is a problem, so that's too expensive then. And uh, that didn't go through, although we continue the, 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 the lobbying, the pressing on it. But that's, that's difficult. Uh, we actually had a special meeting with the Minister of Agriculture and, and Forestry because of all this for two hours we were talking with like five or six people from different, uh, like uh, what we call it, uh, sub divisions, units of the Ministry about all this. Also, we asked for to consider the results-based payment, which is used already by now in many countries, how to do it. We all know it. We even tested it in Finland a bit. We have some understanding, but no, 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 it's too difficult for us. Finland is not known for being innovative or wanting to see the results in this sense. The easier, the better. Uh, so the, the conservation schemes on which we are working now uh, is well, what I mentioned, to improve the nature management field. And then we also want to work with biodiversity-friendly grazing on cultivated pastures. And I give you a few reasons why. And again, I, I stress this is what stakeholders also brought up on those workshops. It's not just kind of my thing from my mind. But we, in Finland, uh, dairy is the single biggest uh, agricultural um, production line. So about a third of all agricultural land is under grassland, and the pasture area halved within like eight years. So, and that's mainly because uh, the free stall barns, if you know, so like he and Vicky, the cows are free to walk inside. But there is no requirement in the Finnish legislation to let them out. So the free cow which Vario started to market last year is actually not free, it's free inside, but, <laughs> but it's a freedom. Is a, is a question mark, so, uh, but then the cows that are in those old-fashioned stalls, so they spend winter locked uh, by their heads to one spot, then they have to be grazed, that's the Finnish legislation. But the, the, their numbers are declining. There are two subsidies, payments, public for grazing cattle, uh, well, also sheep, uh, but uh, there, by the assessment of Loki, the least chosen of all the welfare package measures, so very few farmers actually take them, and it doesn't take into account any grazing as such regime. The cow is outdoors, and that's enough to get money, but it doesn't mean under what sort of grazing pressure and whether any other consideration are uh, taken. So, again, we have very good subsidy for semi-natural grasslands, and of course permanent grasslands are protected by the EU legislation now. But there is only, like, out of all grassland pool, only 30% are the semi-natural. So 97% of grassland is a huge potential for supporting farmland birds, including curlews, including lapwings, and swallows and other. But it's not realized because nobody trying to do anything. So we're losing this possibility. And now we have a new thing coming up very quickly, rotational grazing. Everybody is absolutely crazy about it. There's no evidence or very little to show that it's better for biodiversity. I've reviewed whatever synthesis there is. Everybody claims it is. But we do know from the U United States that it can be very damaging to ground nesting birds because of very high density that flattens everything and then you rotate and then you rotate again. And we don't have any evidence from Finland, so it's actually how you do it, I guess, and whether you take any precautions, uh, like refuges for birds. We're trying now to look at what possibilities can be. For example, 10% of pastures left out for birds as a refuge. Uh, or then if you have a rotational grazing, you, for example, focus it in early vegetation season on areas where there are no birds, uh, like curlew nests. And then you, come, you take your cows to those areas in the end of the season so that you avoid risk of trampling the nests. There are several things to, 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 to look at. And if, if you are interested in any, like, whatever information or if 
specifically if you have ideas of how to develop this grazing scheme, please do contact me because Finland is a very, very small country. There are very few people who work with farmland birds who are concerned about farmland birds and I think like half of them are here in the audience already. <laughs> so, and we will try to work through the commissioner to press on the Finnish government and if we're too late now for this period, it seems to be yes, we're too late. Nonetheless, the environment ministry was interested in taking this up in their own program for live funding and then, I mean, that's not the last cap period. There will be next one. <laughs> so, and by the next one, we'll be better prepared because to come to those negotiation process with empty hats doesn't work. I've already been there for 20 years. You have to come with a really very detailed proposal and then know what you ask and why. Thank you. Thank you, Irina, for a very interesting presentation. And I, I must say that um, I know that we are a bit late for the cap that is now coming. And I have also noticed that it's very difficult to sort of the, it's the interest of farm and birds in the whole huge, I hope I do I'm working here, in the whole cap. The farm and birds in Finland are a very, <laughs> very tiny, tiny bit, and, and the interest is, is, is everywhere else. Everything else is more important than the biodiversity on farm, and so it seems to me. So there is, we definitely need a lot of um, joint uh, operations, and, uh, and actually we need a lot of convincing to the, I think, to the, to the people who are making those um, regulations much more convincing. And I think one of those is this uh, Farm and Bird Index project that Alex is now doing, that that is something that has to be sort of looked at and then brought up as a new paper and said, this is, this is where we are and this is where we, we, what we should do. So I think, I think at, at the moment I have this feeling that there are many good things going on and I hope that we will get something done so that in the next cup comes, we will be wiser. And also I, I hope that we get this, uh, this uh, life project that we get there some parts where we can test, that we could even start testing the possible methods. But I know very well this, this what you said that, that Finland always says that it's, and it's not maybe even that it's difficult to do, but it's, if it's difficult to control, if those people who are controlling, and if, if it's not really, really simple for them to see that if the measure has been fulfilled, then it's taken off because Finland wants to be absolutely sure that we definitely are following the regulation. And if that, if there's some sort of difficulties in that, so then, then they can't apply that because we cannot be sure that everybody is doing as we expect. So we definitely need some pilot farms or something like that, maybe a pilot project. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. But sure. The things you can do it, the actually the things are so cheap for farmers to do that you, the, you can't get this in the, the policy support scheme because there's too little money involved. There's no point of having any transactions. So there is a need for just more advisory. But we have no advisory also that knows birds. No, that's true. So that's true. Yeah. I mean, biodiversity yeah. generally and advisory in Finland are very poorly uh, yes. matched. I mean, advisory in Finland is used for filling up papers. So basically, a farmer asks advisory, so give me the best optimized list of measures I should apply so that I get the most of money out of it and fill the paper for me. And there's nothing there about why I would do it and whether I achieve any benefit at all. So it's just optimizing on financial reward. That's very true. That's actually something that has been recognized, that, that the, the advisory should be maybe educated or somehow schooled better, that they understand better that if, if you want to improve the biodiversity, we need better advisors. We need to educate them. Okay, is that questions? Not yes. necessarily a question, but I, I, and I don't want to ask many because yes. we're heading for lunch. But the advisory system, because we've discussed this and worked on this a bit in the interreg partridge project, it's something that's interesting to the farmers involved. 
Um, is your advisory system paid for by the government, or does it come through an NGO system, or is it a mix? It's a mix. So we have we have a semi-independent body called mm -hmm. ProAgria. So it's paid by the state, but it's not part of the state. Oh, okay. So it's subsidized. So they they provide commercial advice mm -hmm. to farmers pay for it. Okay. But it's not entirely. Okay. because the, the, the state subsidizes Subsidized. quite a lot. But there is very little work on biodiversity there. Ah, okay. Then we have a couple of uh, organizations that provide advice more like landscape and biodiversity, but they are very few and it very much depends who is there. It's like one good person and that's, it works. Yes. And if in another place there is, it doesn't happen to be a good person who is interested personally in biodiversity, then it doesn't work. And then we have a new scheme in this programming pro pro program that any farmer can be an advisor, an independent advisor. It, it, uh, the person has to register and prove that he or she is capable of providing this advice. And under the CUP, uh, the state pays for one advice session with that person. Oh, so the farmers okay. can get it for free, but only for one. And of course, if you have only one, you would focus on your profit rather than on small little birds. A small bird, so yeah, we'll yeah. ask advice that profits you, not, you know, what helps bumblebees. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So once it's for free, the rest is paid. Paid, yes. And then, of course, the projects. Then through projects, you can get advice. Yes. Yeah. So we have a variety in England, or in, yeah, England and in Scotland, and in many of the countries with partridge, the government provides advice, um, and so. When we asked the question if people would pay for advice or be happy to, because we said happy to, um, only in England and Scotland did they say that they would be prepared to pay. Not necessarily happy, but yeah, it was all right, because they already have to. Um, whereas the other countries particularly want it from the government. And uh, part of what we're doing with Partridge is getting these governmental advisors out on the farm and showing them. So yesterday, Francis was leading some of the Natural England new advisors around. So that's part of the project, too, is to train the advisors. I think this needs a lot more work because we need to change the mindset away from just economics. It's shocking that people do not know who are supposedly advising. Shocking. Just the last comment to that one. But actually, that's, that's the thing that we have been sort of with the Hel new Helmi program, and we have this environmental program, that we need more people who have this uh, sort of, uh, that can look at the whole landscape and understand all the different parts of the landscape, that we, we need with more more that kind of advisory overall. Because we have people who know the waters and water protection, and we need people who know some somehow how to how to have good crops on the fields and, and the economy, but if, to have someone who could sort of manage the whole thing and also with the wetlands, where to put the wetland, how to control that, that's something that it's very, we often have one person who does one thing and, and then it has no idea of the rest. So that's, that's a, we need education. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Education will be next stop. <laughs> yes. yes, okay. <laughs> no lunch. Now yeah. lunch. Are we having lunch here? Yeah, Do you yeah, stop yeah. the recording now? Tweet. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, let's return here at uh, 10 past 10 past 1. Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell your online audience also. We will return 10 past 1. Okay. And now. Do we leave everything here or do we take it with us? Uh, we can, but it's, it won't be locked. But, uh,